so he had a special deal with the janitor who he begged to leave the lights on in the library so he could finish his schoolwork. He ended up leaving Oberlin. He went to Harvard Business School, after which he went to Ohio because at the time, anti-Semitism was rampant on Wall Street. He didn't think he could succeed there. He went to Oberlin, I'm sorry, he went back to Ohio, worked in retail, then ended up somehow acquiring a trailer parts manufacturing company took it public, became very successful, and ended up giving a, a gym back to Oberlin and donating the Humanity Center here. And when he was giving his speech at Oberlin, he thanked the janitor for keeping the lights on. Yeah. So I, and I wrote about this in my memoir bookends, but I think about that janitor every day and the impact of books on my life and how I've dedicated my entire life to books and reading and how it is so deeply in my DNA and that the janitor ended up helping me and now is helping all of you as you listen to whatever I'm gonna say. So there you go. <laughs> um, okay, wait, I was gonna turn on a timer, but uh, I can't really see it. No, that's for five minutes. Okay, forget it. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, uh, earlier today, I sent out my Substack, and I was like, I, I'm thinking of trying something new for this keynote speech I'm going to give. I'm getting a little tired of hearing myself talk about all the same things all the time. I think I'm going to do this speech called, Did You Know I Almost, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, oh, no, but what if what if it bombs at Bombeck? Maybe that's what it should be called, <laughs> bombs at Bombeck. So I'm hoping this doesn't bomb at Bombeck. But anyway, um, so I'll tell you my story a little bit through some of the things that I almost did but never happened. Okay, first of all, did you know I almost failed electrical engineering? <laughs> Why was I even taking electrical engineering? <laughs> I <laughs> had a science requirement, and my best friend and roommate, Stacy, who I lived with all through college, said, this is the gut to take for all of us who don't want to do science. So everyone said, you don't even have to study. I used to study all the time for everything, and I was like, great, I don't have to study. I'll focus more on my other classes. I go in, I take the test, and of course I failed it, because. I don't understand electrical engineering. Um, so that was my, my first lesson in uh, not, only, not always listening to friends and also sticking with your strengths. <laughs> um, I instead almost got licensed as a step aerobics instruct instructor. Anybody else here ever do step aerobics back in the day? OK, great. Uh, I almost did that, but I didn't. I almost became a psychologist because after I went to college, I wanted to be a writer. And the first time I wrote anything was when I was nine. And I had two short stories I wrote in school. And my grandparents, who lived right here in Dayton, published it as a miniature book. And I had my name on the spine. And I thought, oh, OK, great. I'll be an author. Uh, so it's taken quite a bit of time. I was 10 when that book came out. And I am 47 now. And my first novel finally came out. So you know, overnight success that I am. Um, but I did fall in love with psychology at school when I realized that I hated all the classes, all the books they were reading in English class. I'm like, well, these aren't the books I like to read. <laughs> so I majored in psychology. I took the GREs, and I thought, OK, this is what I'm going to do. Turns out I kind of am a psychologist now. I talk to people all the time on my podcast. Moms don't have time to read books. I listen. I try to help people through life. And in fact, I've taken another journey to that path as well. But it all kind of all roads lead here. Um, did you know, or did you know I almost started a company when I was single and living in New York City that <laughs> I would go wait in all the bankers and consultants' apartments for the Con Ed to come so that when they were too busy to wait, and in so doing, I could meet someone who worked at these banks and was too busy to meet girls. <laughs> I thought this was genius, and I mentioned it to my dad, who did not think it was genius. <laughs> but he did say, you know, you keep talking about all these businesses you want to start. And I had worked at Idea Lab, which was an internet incubator in Pasadena that started companies all the time. He's like, if you, if you really want to start up a business, you better go to business school. So I thought, OK, well, then I'll definitely meet the bankers then. <laughs> I'm kidding. But I did go to business school. And um, while I was there, uh, I'll say now, did you know I almost dropped out of business school? Uh, this was for less funny reasons. But as I write about also in my memoir bookends, my friend Stacy, who I referenced about electrical engineering, uh, she passed away on, she didn't pass away, she died violently on 9-11 because she worked in the North Tower. 
and uh, that changed my life. It's a thing I've never gotten over. We lived together all through college. We lived together after college. She was my very best friend in the world and disappeared, and that's it. So I know we all have these pivotal moments and stories of loss, and no matter who it is in our lives, but it kind of changes things forever, and this is one of those things that even in the novel I'm writing now is creeping in again, and I, it's changed everything. So it also taught me that if not now, when? And life is short is not a platitude. It is very, very real because from one day to the next, all that was left of her was one strand of hair that I found on a sweater as I was unpacking a box of her clothes. So that's how life became sort of crystal clear. And for those who have gone through grief, you know that when you see other people and you meet other people, there is a common language of it and sort of a shorthand. And this whole post-traumatic growth thing is real, but the sensitivity comes from from loss, so I have some of that as well. Um, and I did try to drop out because I just couldn't handle it, and uh, they convinced me to stay on with the help of this tutor who's actually <laughs> coming to my book event in Chicago soon. So anyway, thanks to Craig, and I did not drop out of school. Um, during that time, did you know I almost ran the New York City Marathon, except because I got in on the lottery, but after my first training run, I realized I could not run, and I quit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so did you know I almost published my first novel right after business school? I decided after all of that trauma that I would take a year off and I happened to have lost a, other people, several other close friends and family during that period of time. So I said, I'm taking a year off and pursuing my dream. My whole life, I wanted to write a book. So I will take a year off and write this novel. And I had other jobs too as I was there and, uh, to, you know, freelance writing, I had this side hustle at Weight Watchers, um, which you can read the book to find out about. Um, but I did, you know, night and day, I was writing this novel. I started it from scratch four different times. I got an agent. I thought it would sell. I was so excited. I had told everyone in the world this is what I was doing, and then it didn't sell. I was so humiliated by this entire experience that I didn't try writing fiction again for over a decade. I just thought, okay, maybe this isn't for me. Nonfiction has always been easy for me. I tend to share openly in writing, and it's very easy for me to do so. And from the time I was 14, when I wrote my first article for Seventeen magazine about how it felt to have gained weight, a lot of weight during a single year when my parents got divorced, and how uncomfortable I felt, and how I felt so judged, and all this stuff, Seventeen magazine ran that, and they got so many letters thanking me through the magazine for being so open about it that it encouraged me to keep writing openly about the things I felt embarrassed about, the things I was ashamed of, the things I felt nobody else felt. Turns out they always do. There are always people who feel these things. Um, so that came easy. I've had lots of practice doing that, uh, but not so much for fiction. So I was totally mortified and felt like a giant failure. Luckily, the agent got me in touch with some ghostwriters. I ghost wrote a book, so I at least had the experience of publishing, and then I had twins and stayed home for 11 years. But did you know, I almost ghost wrote another book by two very famous health and wellness people, who I won't say because I promised at the time that I wouldn't, but I drove there uh, to interview with them, and I left my twins with my mother for all of 30 minutes, and I was like, well, I can't do that. <laughs> so I uh, decided to stay home and um, spend the time with the kids. I have four kids, and my twins are almost 17 now, which is somehow just wild uh, and crazy. But at least I gave up with that. At least I had experience with that. Did you know I almost had brain surgery because they found a benign tumor in my brain? This is a real crowd pleaser of a, of a talk here. Um, <laughs> I'm really just trying to make you laugh with all my happy stuff. Um, turned out it was totally benign, and the reason I was forgetting everything was because I was completely stressed out and overtired. Mom brain, there you go. So that's why I had any symptoms. Um, did you know I almost impersonated Sofia Coppola? Because one time I was at a restaurant, and in walked Harvey Weinstein, and... <laughs> And he caught, I was looking at him because he was him. This is a long time ago. So nothing had come out yet. And he started looking at me directly. And I was like, why is he looking at me? And he crossed the whole restaurant and kept walking over to me. And then he walked right up to my table. And like the well-mannered girl I am, I stood right up and he shook his hand. And he was like, Sophia, how are you? <laughs> and I was like, I'm fine. How are you? <laughs> Anyway, um, 
<laughs> Did you know I almost took a bone density scan about 11 years ago, but the doctor said, is there any chance you might be pregnant? And I said, oh gosh, no, there's no way. I, you know, I wanted to have kids, more kids after my twins for a while and it's just not gonna happen. And he said, oh, we'll just take one anyway. Anyway, now I have a 10-year-old daughter, and after that, I had another son. So uh, things are not always according to plan. But yes, I have four kids, and, uh, and that's been wonderful. Um, did you know I almost stayed married the first time for a decade, but I didn't? Uh, did you know I thought about training for a minute to be a champion in the age 40 and up women's tennis circuit. <laughs> After I fell in love with my second husband, Kyle, who's here today, and Kyle was my, well, at first he was my son's tennis pro for a day. Don't judge us, we love each other. <laughs> uh, and then he taught me tennis lessons all summer, and by the following, what, year we were engaged. So there you go. You can read all about that, not only in bookends, but in this very personal essay I wrote for Vogue recently, which when it came out and I read it, I was like, oof, I think I went a little too far this time. <laughs> so you can read my, my honesty there. Um, did you know that I almost got my in-laws crumb cakes into Whole Foods? Kyle's family had a crumb cake business based in Charleston, and I looked up one day, and he was on the couch, and I was like, what are you up to? And he was like, well, I'm doing a Kickstarter campaign for this business my mom and my sister want to do, and as I mentioned, I love starting businesses. So I was like, whoa, 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 wait. So two minutes later, I had a business plan and helped them, and there were, just so you know, if you're trying to get a food into Whole Foods, there are a lot of label requirements, and it is a pain. So good luck with that. I did not do it. <laughs> we gave up. Um, did you know that I almost completely sweated through my shirt when I was interviewing Andre Agassi as one of my very first podcast guests on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books? I, my heart was pounding. I was a mess. Uh, I had gotten to interview him through Kyle's Tennis Connections, and Open is one of my favorite books. Did anyone read Open? It's, like, so good. Anyway. Um, so that was like my first idol who I got to interview. The reason I started the podcast is that after my divorce, I suddenly had all this extra time every other weekend when my ex had the kids. It was so sad to see their rooms empty and have to just go about life. And I had this therapist at the time who said, "If you have, remember you love to read. If With a good book, you'll never be lonely. And so I got back into reading, which I've always done. I'm a huge reader. And I got back into writing, which is what I love to do. I started writing tons of parenting articles articles, one of which went viral at the beginning called A Mother's Right to Sanity, and it is so on brand that I am at the Irma Bombeck conference talking about this because it is right up her alley. The preschool had asked for empty toilet paper rolls as a, something we had to bring in the next day, and I was like, I am drawing the line right here. I am <laughs> not unspooling all the toilet paper in my house. I am just going to have to go in empty-handed, and I did. And I was like, this is crazy. So I wrote this whole thing. It encouraged me to keep writing. I had so many essays after a while that Kyle, who I was then dating, said, why don't you turn all those essays into a book? And I said, ugh, moms don't have time to read books. And I was like, oh, that's so funny. That's what I'll call my book. Well, the people in publishing that I spoke to about it did not think publishers would find that at all funny. Uh, but a girlfriend suggested I start a podcast instead because I had no platform. Don't know if anybody's ever heard that. But in 2017, I had nothing. And I was like, well, I've been freelancing for 20 years. No. So I had to get on social media. A friend suggested I start a podcast. And I was like, OK, I might as well try. What's the risk? I'll just like get a microphone and plug it in and see what happens, uh, which is basically what I did. I knew about three authors at the time, thought I'd start with them, and one thing led to another. I've now done 1,800 episodes with authors, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So those interviews have led me to start everything else that has happened since. I did not have a business plan for the company that I have now. I never thought I would start a publishing house, which I ended up doing after I learned about all the experiences of authors, knowing how much I also wanted to be an author myself, and seeing the disappointment on all these authors' faces as they talked about their publishing experience and how they didn't really get the support and the love and the commitment and the help that they had expected, and that their books were not really flying off the shelves, and that the, dis the experience itself was disappointing. 
And I thought that was like a tragedy. I love books. I love authors. And I wanted to try to do something to help. So I experimented in lots of the different ways. Did you know I almost named Zibby Books Time Pressed, which I thought was hilarious. <laughs> but I didn't. I also almost named it after my dog, Naya, called Naya Books. And my co-founder at the time was like, you cannot name this after Naya. Um, but I almost did. Um, I uh, started having book fairs and book salons in my apartment at the advice of Danny Shapiro, who was one of my favorite authors. Does anybody else love Danny Shapiro? Anyway, I'm a huge fan. And she was doing an interview with me and said, lots of people do these book salons. You should try it. Well, I loved doing that, and I started doing that. And I think that the book salons and then the book fairs I had ended up leading to the bookstore I opened in Santa Monica. So basically everything I've done has started with something small that I've kind of tested out and realized that I loved and made into something bigger. So I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm gonna start this whole company with like all these different divisions and blah, blah, blah. I was just trying to sell a book, right? Which is hard. It was actually easier to do all the other stuff because along the way, I continued to get things rejected. I pitched a book. Oh, did you know I also, this is getting annoying, maybe a little, um, that I almost, uh, I tried to sell a book called Happy Sad, Happy Sad. I tried to sell a novel called 40 Love, about falling in love again at 40, which I, in the middle of the night, thought would be really great as a full-length prose poem, which is crazy. <laughs> so I tried that, and it wasn't really until I accepted my voice is what it is, that I am not necessarily going to be the most literary, lyrical author. But I can write like I talk, which is usually much better than this. And I can just tell it like it is. And maybe that's enough. And I decided also with blank that if I was going to take time out of my busy life and away from my kids and my husband and my work and everything to write a novel that nobody was asking for, that I better be having fun. So I decided I was gonna have fun. I was gonna make myself laugh. I didn't care if anybody else laughed. But as I was typing, I was gonna chuckle. And I did. I just, and I almost gave my advance back. I was almost like to my agent, I don't think I can pull this off. And he's like, oh, but you wanted it for so long. So I didn't give up and I had fun and that's how I got it done. And it turns out that was the secret that even though people say that, I didn't totally realize it until I was right in the middle of it. So anyway, if you're wondering, which I'm going to tell you anyway, uh, my novel Blank, which is, by the way, a USA Today bestseller, which is really exciting. Yep. Uh, it's about, it, take, it took everything I've learned about publishing and writing and the messy middle of it all and being a crazy mom and all the rest and put it all into a fictional character who is so not me. Really, we have nothing in common. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, her name's Pippa Jones, and we might not be the same person, but we would definitely be really close friends. And she is a best-selling author who can't think of an idea for her second book. So at the advice of her son, she hands it in blank as a commentary on the publishing industry and how does it even matter what's inside of a book? Isn't it just all about the marketing that makes a book a success? So she decides to sort of take on the publishing industry in that way, her agent fires her immediately, and it basically turns her life upside down. Uh, it splits people, loyalties are divided, and it really affects her personal life. And we go into her, you know, her troubled marriage and all these other things. And what she learns at the end, which I hope to give as a parting message, uh, is that there is always time for your next chapter. It's never too late for the next act and owning your voice is so important. Also, that it does matter what you write, and all authors are super important. Readers have to just be a little bit more informed about the fact that what they're being served up might not necessarily be the best book for them, and that the books in huge stacks at the bookstore all the way up front are there for a reason, usually because the publisher has decided those are the books. And I think that's great for those books, but I feel so badly for the other books. And sometimes the other books, the one on the high shelf, in the back, that is the book that you need more than anything. This is similar to what Anna was saying last night with uh, the banned books, but you might not discover it right away if you're only reading the bestsellers, you're only reading a handful of books. I think widely reading and discovering more books benefits everybody and just might be what just might be what the doctor ordered. So that's another one of the messages in the book. Um, 
Did you know I almost lost my phone eight million times, and that was only yesterday? <laughs> uh, did you know I almost went to the retreat that we hosted in Austin, but I got too sick and finally wrote the first 10,000 words of my next book? <laughs> we host retreats for Zibi Media, which you should all think about since you're already traveling for writing, and we have uh, retreats coming up in Chicago and Palm Springs. So if you like gathering with like-minded readers, you should check it, check it out at zibimedia.com. That's my little ad. Um, but we do gather people a lot. We have a book club and events and retreats and classes and all sorts of fun stuff. And I've, you, I've just tried to find ways for the authors that I love to get their messages out into the world more. So that's what the company's all about. Um, did you know that I almost wrote a book called Lover's Leap, a rom-com set in the competitive backgammon industry? <laughs> Which I thought was genius. Does anybody here play backgammon? Because Lover's Leap is a move when you do six and five as an opening move. I thought it was so, anyway, my editor said no. Uh, but what she did say yes to is my next book, which will be called Overheard. And that is about a bookstore owner in Santa Monica. Huge jump, again. <laughs> Uh, uh, whose ex-husband comes in to introduce her and the kids to his first new serious girlfriend post-divorce. Turns out she's the biggest deal movie star around, and she's not happy about that. She goes to her son's football game and is complaining and just questioning the validity of some of these do-gooder claims of the movie star about turtles and the Gal Galapagos, and I don't even know, and saying all these things to her best friend, and the live stream of the football game picks it up, and the whole community hears their conversation. <laughs> She's then canceled, and the rest of the book is about how she gets back on the good graces of the community with the help of her kids. This happened to me. <laughs> Although I didn't say anything bad, thank goodness. But at my son's football game, Kyle and I were watching with my ex-husband and his fiance, who is now 31, was then 30, but it's okay, she's really nice. And we were with my other three kids, and we found out after when my, hus when my son asked to see some footage that, of course, I missed the big play because I was like looking the other way or something, uh, we started playing it back, and you could hear our voices the whole time. I was like, so then I thought, oh my gosh, what did I say? We were there forever. I mean, it was a, a whole afternoon. And then I thought, well, what could I have said that would have ruined my life? And so I went down that path for a while. And then I thought, oh my gosh, I just have to write a book about this. This would be so fun. So that's what I did. And Overheard is theoretically coming out in October of 2025. But I don't know, because moms don't have time to write. <laughs> um, Yes, did you know I almost crashed my car eight million times as well? I have no sense of direction. If I walk into you by accident or whack you with my bag, I am spatially challenged, so don't, don't judge me too harshly. I don't know if anybody else is like this, but at least the reading part of the brain is, is good. The, the rest, not so much. Um, did you know I almost hosted a podcast called Did You Know I Almost? <laughs> this was our idea from two days ago. But now I think I want to make it a book because I prefer writing to talking and saying these things that are not fully edited. But anyway, um, <laughs> did you know I almost got up here today and told you my life story with absolutely no outline, but I didn't want to bore my husband again, so I decided to do it differently. <laughs> so now I'm wondering, what did you almost do? So why don't you just talk to somebody next to you for a second and just tell them one thing that you almost did. What did you almost do? that would have changed your life? One minute? Yeah. One minute? Good. 
Okay. Did everybody learn about each other? Yeah? Okay. All right, you can for sure continue this conversation after the Q&A. Was that fun? Didn't you learn great stuff? Yeah, okay. <laughs> to be continued. Um, okay, so we have time for some Q&A, uh, and I hope that you will all go back to asking each other these questions the rest of the weekend and getting to know people because there is nothing I enjoy more than learning people's life stories, and hopefully you all share that curiosity, and you'll find out about each other. Anyway, does anyone have any questions? We have a few minutes for Q&A. Marcy. <laughs> no. Did, the question was, did I help Andre Agassi write open? I did not. Um, I think J.R. Moringer helped Andre Agassi write open. Best book ever. I agree. It's so good. Um, but that was flattering. Thank you for thinking I could do that. Yes. <laughs> Um, what's your best advice for dealing with rejection in this industry and in this field? So now that I'm a publisher, we get pitched books all the time. And I realize that when we reject them, it's not that there's necessarily anything wrong with the book. Sometimes these books are great. Sometimes I'm like, oh, that's probably going to be a bestseller. But like, we're not the place to do it. It's outside of what we publish, or we acquired something similar, or our list is full for that season, or the timing's not going to work. So I would say a lot of it is not rejection. It's just that it didn't fit at that time in that place. And it's not a it's not a referendum on you and your talent. So I think having that mentality is really helpful. I took a class once from Susan Shapiro, who works for the New School. I don't know if anyone took her class. She teaches about writing for magazines and newspapers. Um, she taught me in her class that she always has a list going of like 10 places she's going to submit an essay. And so it's not emotional. The first place rejects, OK, great, fine. Line out, go on to the next. And I think that mentality is helpful in, in pitching books and anything else. Also, that you just need one. Like, this is not, you don't need an embarrassment of riches here when you're trying to publish. When I put, when I had bookends out on Proposal, which is a memoir of love, loss, and literature I think I forgot to talk about, but in it I tell my life story, including all the books that I read along the way, and at the end I have a seven-page reading list, uh, in case you're wondering the books that shaped me, which you're probably not, but there you go. Um, <laughs> I had on my daughter's whiteboard in her room, I wrote out all the names of like the 50 publishers I sent the book to. And as each <laughs> rejection came in, I would just like wipe it out with my finger. <laughs> and then we would keep wipe wiping them out. Uh, but you know what? Eventually I found a publisher and my editor's wonderful and she's the right person for me. But it wasn't a fit. Or maybe they thought I was a terrible writer. But either way, I'll never know. And you won't either. <laughs> Just one second. Sorry, what? Oh, I, I can be. <laughs> Talk about how you started your bookstore. What is that process like and operating it while you're still writing? Yeah, the biggest challenge in operating the bookstore is that the bookstore is in Santa Monica and I live in New York City. <laughs> which was clearly avoidable, but this is what happened. Um, yes, I meant to say, did you know I almost opened a bookstore in New York City? Because before the pandemic, I was looking for spaces in New York. I've always wanted to own a bookstore. I mean, most readers, it's like a dream. I didn't think it would ever actually happen. But I was going to partner with another bookstore that was firmly established uh, to do an offshoot in New York City. And I, the rent is like ridiculous. It's like, how on earth can this be a business? And I was concerned about competing with so many other bookstores in New York. They didn't really, New York doesn't really need another bookstore. They have wonderful bookstores that I go to all the time. So when we were, we have a, a whole life in LA. After I got divorced, my brother and his kids live in LA. I used to live in LA. My husband works in LA. So we spend a lot of time out there. And there was an Amazon bookstore in the Pacific Palisades where we live that was, you know, when Amazon closed their bookstores, there was an empty space, and Kyle's like, well, now's the time for that bookstore. And I'm like, ha ha, funny. Um, but I called the broker just on a whim. Like, I was like, that space is ridiculous. So I called, and they were like, no, no, and now it's an Yves Saint Laurent. But the, uh, they were, the broker said, I, I do have this space available on Montana in Santa Monica. And I was like, no, no, that's too far. Meanwhile, I was coming from New York. 
<laughs> but that like 15 minute drive was like a deal breaker for me. Uh, so for a long time I didn't look at it. And then I finally drove over and saw the space and it's so perfect. And the because I inadvertently negotiated I got a better and better rate the longer I sort of held out, which was not even a holdout. It was just I didn't want it. And so um, I got a fabulous deal, and I was like, maybe I'll do a pop-up. And then I walked in, and I was like, oh, no, I have to renovate this. I'm going to put this wallpaper here, and we've got to change the floors. And so I just fell in love with the space and knew I could make it something special. It, From a business standpoint, it is really – the most important thing is finding a great manager who knows what they're doing. I guess in really any business pursuit is finding the right people who have experience. Um, you know, I talked to a lot of other bookstore owners – what point of sale do you use, blah, blah, blah. I met, talked to a lot of different people who had had experience, good and bad, and took all of that knowledge and put it to use. It's wonderful. It's even better than I expected, meeting people, having everybody come in, hearing what people talk about, what books they're looking for and why, and how they're interacting with the booksellers. And it's just magic. It's all just magic. So. Uh, I highly recommend it. I highly recommend working in a bookstore. The, most of the people who work in our bookstore are authors who are doing this because they love books. And it's created this really wonderful culture and has changed this little community because in LA, the communities are, are really that tiny. And the one next door, Diesel, which is wonderful, in Brentwood is a different audience than the audience in Santa Monica. So finding the right spot, finding a community that will be grateful for you and not annoyed by a new comer. I think all of those are really important. Also, our bookstore is curated really differently because I knew I wouldn't be there, first of all, all the time. So how could I get my recommendations across? And because independent bookstores can't possibly compete on selection. So why try? Why try to have everything? It's impossible. So what do, can an independent bookstore offer that a big box store cannot? And that's curation and personalization. And that's really what I do with the podcast and everything anyway. So our bookshelves are Books that make you laugh, books that make you cry, books for the anxious, motherhood malaise, coming of middle age, reeling from divorce. Like, it's funny. And people come in looking for usually something to help them through something or a mood or whatever. And, of course, we have bestsellers and all of that. And we have books curated by other authors because people often want to know, well, what are they reading? So we do it in a new way, and we have lots of events all the time, but can always use the traffic in the store. So if you know people who ever go to Santa Monica or live there, please send them to Zibby's bookshore, Bookstore Bookshop on 11th and Montana. Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so can you tell us what Irma Bombeck means to you? Oh. Um, says the performer of the Irma Bombeck one-woman show who thinks of nothing else but this question and probably has a better answer. Um, Irma Bombeck is someone I started reading after I had kids. Her, her words, Anna Quinlan's words, all of that deeply personal, funny, heartfelt stuff about being a mom, that got me through all of it. I loved it. It was like the older sister. She's like the older sister I didn't have. And I just love it. I, I love, she means to me that humor and taking your life experience in a Seinfeld kind of way, like there is nothing wrong with that. Taking from your life is what you have to do and what you should do. And it's funny and it's connective. And if you write about the things that other people are going through, you will find your people. And I think that's what Irma did for so many people, the honesty, the openness, realizing, pulling back just enough to observe the craziness makes being in it that much more bearable. So that's what she means to me. Okay. Yeah. There's so many things that you own up to this. <laughs> Oh, the question was, you've almost done a lot of things that you didn't do. Is there anything still on your bucket list? Yes. My bu this whole thing came about because I talked to Kyle about something else I wanted to do. And I'm like, it would be funny if I kept a list of all the things I said I wanted to do. Uh, but yes, on my bucket list, I am currently adapting uh, a failed submission of a middle grade novel with my daughter into a graphic novel. So I would really like, it's called The Diary Hoppers, about uh, a group of girls who have the power to jump back into their uh, mom's diaries. So. If anybody knows anybody who would like to acquire that, I'm definitely open to that. So we're working on that with an illustrator. Uh, I have this 
nuts. It's, I mean, I have another pipe dream that will probably never happen, but I, I really want to open Zibby's hotel, where, which would be a total book hotel, and there would be a concierge, a book concierge in the lobby instead of a concierge. And you would check in, and there would be all the books you want to read waiting in your room, and different libraries everywhere, and book clubs could go, and there could be retreats. And I have this whole vision. I see the whole thing in my head. I don't know. I mentioned it to my family, and they're like, we, th that's an entirely different industry. <laughs> I was like, I know. <laughs> um, so I don't know. That's, I have that bug at the moment. Uh, I really want to do that. But I probably won't. But you never know with me, so I might. What? Yeah. Why doesn't Zibby Books Publishing publish my own books? Well, when I sold Bookends, I hadn't launched Zibby Books Publishing yet. Um, I was thinking about it, but I hadn't done it, and I was just in the planning stages. I I wouldn't subject my team to me. <laughs> I mean, it's a different. It, it's just different, and also. You know, I, I, I'm the type of person who craves external validation. I, I need the applause, and I needed the book contract, and I need somebody other than me telling me that my book has value and that will pay me for my books. Like, that's really nice. And then I can just take that and put it into my business and help other people publish their books. So that's really why. Should I go? Um, hi. <laughs> um, you seem like an incredibly busy, creative person. Um, what does your personal um, like writing practice look like? Where do you squeeze that in <laughs> to your crazy busy life? Yeah, it's not pretty. Um, <laughs> I do it I for nonfiction, like a newsletter, an essay, even my memoir. I could do that anytime, anywhere. I could flip open my laptop while we were waiting for the kids' doctor's appointment and they were playing on like the video games they provide there. You know, I can do it with... 10 minutes, I can write a little something. Fiction is not that way for me. I don't have as much practice, and it's harder. I need quiet and time and space, and I have none of those things. So it's been hard. The way I finished bookends, the way I started bookends is that I have a friend who used to own a bookstore who is now managing a hotel, and she snuck me into a room between 9 AM and when the next guest was checking in. <laughs> She's like, you can do this once. And I was like, OK. And I sat there, and I cranked out words. Um, and likewise, to finish it, I only had like three days to write like a, a third of the book, something crazy. And I just shut everything off and took three days and just wrote the first draft, the end of the first draft. So the qu basically, I have to shut down everything else and cram it in to fit it in, um, but I'm having trouble doing that for this book because I'm out in the world in the middle of my Zibbyverse tour, which is supposed to be a tongue-in-cheek um, reminder that authors are rock stars, which is how I feel about all authors. And I don't have friendship bracelets here, but we do have fun sunglasses for all of you. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going all over the country and trying to go to all the bookstores that I've always wanted to visit and meet people in the community or who have been following on Instagram for a while or Zippy Books Ambassadors or all that because I think it's really important to get out there and meet actual people and not just post but interact. And um, so that's why I'm doing that. And that's why I'm having a hard time <laughs> writing uh, at all. Anyway, thank you so much for your time. I, I get to present you with a uh, signed cartoon of uh, Bob Eckstein. <laughs> so there you go. Aww. It says telephone sex. It says we'll work for blurbs. I neglected to tell you this yesterday, but the, what it says is we'll work for blurbs. Amazing. Thank you so much. No, my pleasure. Thank you. That Thank was you. great. Thank you. Please give her another round of applause. That was fantastic. <laughs> I, 
I, uh, I want to thank the, uh, the virtual audience for joining us this afternoon. Uh, we will see you later on tonight. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are here in person, uh, the afternoon workshops begin at 2 p.m. Uh, if you're attending my friend Jane Condon's uh, stand-up comedy boot camp, Janie, I don't know where you're sitting. Hey, Janie. Um, uh, that'll be right here in this room. Uh, Zibby will be signing copies of her books to the side of the stage. Her books are available for purchase. She's leaving. So 